Good morning, everyone. This is Ron. It's Saturday morning, a uh, little after 10 a.m. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started on our session. We will begin with questions. I guess uh, first what I'll try to do is uh, uh, briefly talk about what uh, our last meeting was Monday evening. And we talked about Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, we talked about the vision of Isaiah, what he saw in, in relationship to uh, where we are now, how we are living the scriptures, how we are bringing life to these scriptures, and and uh, this vision that he sees uh, is is an internal uh, visit of who we are. It shows us uh, what is taking place uh, in inside of us, uh, and and uh, we we see that all of us has a king. Uh, Uzziah, who was the catalyst uh, in, internally to give us the vision of Elohim and the vision of ourselves. So we, we looked at that, and uh, at the very beginning of that, uh, Barbara did a kind of a, a synopsis, if you will, of, of the book of Isaiah, and uh, it kind of got me to looking at a couple other things that I had not seen it from there. So we, I'm sure we will visit Isaiah again uh, and, and uh, in the near future. But any questions about what we talked about Monday? Any questions about anything you have seen this week or just anything in general? Are questions you still there, Ron? Sir? Hello? Can Are you, you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I think it might be my connection. Okay. Did everybody else hear me? Hear me okay? Yeah, just fine. Okay. Yes. Now, all I was doing was just kind of uh, talking about where we were Monday night. Nick, we went to uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 6 uh, when, when uh, Isaiah has his dream or his vision when Cain as I died. And uh, so we, we kind of talked about that and uh, how it really kind of shows us where we are right now. And uh, so that's about it though. Is there any, any questions and or comments guys from, on, on anything? Ron, I have a, an observation. <laughs> okay. Oh, I, I, and it's about uh, something that I was reading late recently about well, you've heard the story of all of these artifacts that museums have and have been pill have pillaged for hundreds of years and taken away from the countries to which they belong. Well, this one is about the British Museum and they have in their possession 14, um, 14 artifacts. They're small, no, 11, 11 artifacts. They're small wooden plaques called tablets. And they were taken from an Ethiopian um, fort um, years and years ago. Uh, the thing about these tablets is that they were intricate to the worship of the Christian, Ethiopian Christians, uh, because they thought they contained the presence of God. Well, in essence, everything contains the presence of God. But for people in the ancient world, it, it, it really, it really was important to them. They have asked for those artifacts to be returned um, because they're considered holy pieces. They're so holy that they, I mean, even the museum cu curator hasn't seen very much of them since 1868. They're covered. Uh, and, and they're trying to uh, honor uh, the Christian uh, Ethiopians' uh, desire uh, concerned that these are holy pieces. But anyway, these tablets are about 14 inches, and the Ethiopians came to visit in 2018, 
and again requested the return of the artifacts. The um, British Museum says that they won't return it because they're concerned about if they start to returning this, then they'll have to start returning pieces from the Parthenon, pieces from here and pieces from that. So just wondering what some, anyone thought about um, this continued uh, theft, if you will, by not only Britain, but museums all over, including Metropolitan in, in, in New York, not necessarily openly uh, in terms of their colonial imperialism, meaning take, trying to take over people's countries as well as their culture, as well as stealing their artifacts. But the museum uh, in, in uh, New York has several pieces that have been stolen and, and, and are thinking about returning those pieces. But the British Museum just seems set. They are determined not to return these, these artifacts, saying, saying, we are keeping these artifacts so that anybody can see them because uh, it's free to the public. I wonder what, if there are any thoughts about that. I, I think that is another way of understanding uh, the um, effort that had been put forth from from the time that um, that um, we came in contact with uh, Europeans, and that is uh, to destroy you your culture and take everything of value from you and devalue you, the one to whom it belongs. Uh, I, I think that um, at some point uh, it will be returned. Everything will be returned. Um, and the reason I believe that is because there are, there are energies at work behind the scenes that are bringing things into being much faster than uh, anticipated when you look at the annals of time. And this is the, the return of that and everything else is predicated on bringing balance to the earth. And that balance that, we, that needs to be brought to the earth uh, will be the facilitator for those artifacts and others being returned, especially now that uh, <clears throat> we've been shown uh, who and how there is, who is making an attempt to uh, control the world itself, and it's not the government, it's Christianity, and we can get into that later, but I also believe that Christianity has a great hand in what the British and others are doing. So, plus, um, the sacredness of them is dependent, uh, not the sacredness is dependent, the return of sacred things is dependent upon those, the depth of, of uh, and the reason for those who are in this earth desire them to be returned. Do you want them returned because they belong to you? Or do you want them returned because you understand the uh, the sanctity of it and it is from the depth of your soul that you're seeking them rather than just seeking them because they have uh, quote-unquote historical value? I think that plays a role as well. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I was looking at it all from the perspective of you 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 steal a people and you force them to get their culture and you you force a, a, your your way of bondage on them not even your way of life because you teach them not how to be like what you call freedom but you teach them how to be slaves and 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 try to teach them how to find satisfaction in that because that is who they are destined to be. And you, you steal away not only their God, 
but you their their culture and their way of life and their community even as you teach them to divide and hate each other. So I I, I was listening to what you were saying and what the pastor's response was and maybe all of these artifacts and things are indicative of that. Maybe maybe that is the symbolic of what is happening to mankind. And so what is what is precious that was taken when that is restored, which is uh uh what we're I guess attempting to do now for mankind, then yeah, I, I feel that as Pastor do does uh it, to me it is more important to restore dignity to mankind than the artifacts, but I do see them as being linked and being one one and the same. But uh anyway, that's my two yeah, cents. I was, I... Ron, I would say that the restoring the artifact does restore the dignity in a sense too, because this is this is tied up in their their belief system, and so yeah, uh, it, it's like something is ripped from the fabric of their cultural belief to have this in the in the in the museum there. And and the other thing I would say, as Pastor sp- t- spoke, I, I was thinking that this just was the in your face. Uh, representative or symbol symbolic of the greed uh, that's there to, to keep something that's not yours there are o- over two million pieces in that museum and i wonder how many pieces would be there if every single piece was restored to uh its cultural origin so it, it it's all about greed and all about uh the, the dominance, if you will, again. Of, um, but think yeah. about what you. Yeah, go ahead. What, what 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 you said was, if we return these, we got to return everything else we stole. In essence, that's what he was saying. If we return this, then everything else we stole would have to be returned too. And our museum would be empty. That's what they're saying. Yeah. 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 Like. We know what we did. We, we know none of this belongs to us. That's Wait, the arrogance. Yes, it is. Yeah, but you... isn't, that a, isn't that a spiritual? I mean, I mean that's a. It's almost a a spiritual revelation that they don't understand. They're trying to steal um, what it is they think they want, but from a spiritual perspective. If if they understood themselves spiritually, they would understand that they have everything they need, and they don't have to steal from another to feel worth. But out of ignorance, that's where you are. Well, just as a small note, and it's in no way, I'm not by any means taking the sides of of the British Museum. They've made small gestures of returning things but their rationale has always been as i understood it the instability of the colonies they used to control and therefore the uncertainty of how this could be respected and cared for but doesn't that sound familiar bring that to black americans bring that but i think the mother of all whatever that that's i'd like to see museums just completely um reconceptualized but I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime. Um, but the mother of all museums is the Vatican. You, If anybody's ever been to the Vatican and you walk through that hall, I forget what it's called, and you look at all the gold on the wall and the ceilings, I haven't heard one person, when, when I was there, I didn't hear one person say, how'd that all come to be? So, you know, it goes, it's everywhere. It's all it's in all the colonies, but yeah, the whole thing about giving it back is if I and you've heard this in your own person in your own life closer to not even talking about artifacts. Well, if we let you do it, then other people are going to want to do it, right? It's the same same thing. So you know, they're just more structured about it, my view. But I'd like to see the whole concept of a museum. 
just rebuilt from the ground up. And we have the same problem in the United States. I mean, Native American Native peoples have been asking for land that's sacred. They've been asking for artifacts, as we euphemistically call them, to, to be returned. We've done the same thing. Agreed. Um, I want to introduce something based on this. Unless someone else has something else they want to um, speak about in reference to what Barbara brought up, what we've been discussing in the last few minutes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and listening to, to the dialogue based upon what Ms. Barbara presented, um, even if the artifacts are not returned, and it sounds pretty much like the artifacts will not be returned, um, I do feel that by snatching and grabbing, uh, this is what really upsets life. Um, yet if the artifacts are not returned, I am still obligated. I'm still obligated to maneuver fair and square of how I maneuver and how I speak. So if the artifacts are not returned, it's what I'm obligated to do. I think um, when we snatch and grab, whether it's artifacts or uh, whether it's a pair of Joy Dash jeans or uh, lying on our taxes, the earth does not take a liking to that. I do feel that the earth takes a liking to sharing, even if it's just a stick of juicy fruit gum. Someone asks, if I ask a prey, hey, can I get a stick of gum? Hey, this is my last one. I'll split it with you. That's sharing. So um, that's what I'm obligated to do. Still share. Because uh, when you share, you will never be without and whoever you're sharing with will never be without. And I'm also obligated to be fair in the square by how I maneuver. And if you maneuver fair in the square, when you speak, it should back up what you say because um, in some cases when you do speak, someone's going to tell you or ask you, well, how do you lead by example? Then once you give an example, uh, then they need consistency. Now you got to give examples. So snatching and grabbing does not do the earth any good. Uh, I do feel sharing, um, it heals the earth and I think it makes it fertile. Thank you very much. Um, sharing does make it, make things better. That's balance if everyone does it, stealing does not. And that's what we're talking about, rogues, who stole people and stole everything that was dear to their heart. Um, and because the things that they stole were primarily connected to the spirituality of the people. And this is a far cry uh, from um, snatching and grabbing uh, jeans or something of that nature. We're talking about someone who has made an effort uh, to force a people to to um, worship a God that does not exist. Um, and in doing so, presenting themselves as, as God. Uh, the reason uh, um, that is very simple to see when you, when you understand that, regardless of who the um, holy men were or the uh, holy women were, in in the, in the east, all of them are painted as European, which means that uh, that the projection, the projection, the uh, the object of all of this is to make sure that we see everything holy and spiritual as being a Caucasian who comes out of Europe, as opposed to the reality of what's real. So this is far cry from snatching and grabbing. Uh, the um, they didn't snatch and grab; they killed and took. So that's a different ball game. 
a different place to be in, rather. And we have never, ever, ever been in the, in that position of stealing those things that were dear to someone's heart or dear to their um, their, their belief systems. That is not who we are. We never have been. And to think that we would uh, do the same thing to those who uh, perpetrated all these atrocities on us is to think the same way uh, the slave master thinks. Um, that was the whole argument in slavery, especially in South Carolina, when, slave, when the slave outnumbered uh, the uh, white people in South Carolina. The whole thing was if they are set free, they're going to retaliate against us, and that did not happen. Um, Matt Turner didn't retaliate. He fought to be free. So I'm done. Ron, if you're talking, we don't hear you. No, I'm 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 not saying anything yet. I was just uh, just thinking. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just want to comment. Um, this is Audrey. Good morning. Um, I agree with Pastor. This whole thing, the whole thing of all of that, was to strip them of their beliefs and try to insinuate. Christianity, quote unquote, into into the mix, um, because at the time of all the exploration, the Inquisition was happening in Europe, so they were forcing their brand of Christianity onto everybody, uh, everybody they came into contact with. So this was an effort to to stamp out, destroy any notion of any other sort of religion or belief also. So they wanted to um, either strip them of their artifacts, um, kill anybody who didn't agree with what they were, were um, demanding them to take on in terms of Christianity. Um, and yeah, establishing European power. That's what it was all about. And, and Audrey, they're still doing the same thing. They are trying to solidify European power around the world in, in a manner that has not been done before. Um, and that's coming from the evangelical church. It's obvious, I think, anyway, in the... Um, article that uh, the facilitators received, especially when you when you uh, consider what they have already gotten done and what effort, what they are on the road to bring into fruition. With that happening, I think that there will be a solidification of uh, European power still being led by um, the Christian Church in America, as it is being, as it worldwide is being uh, led, uh, has been led by the Rome, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. This is something to look at. Um, the um, uh, one called me this morning, asked me to read a verse. In Isaiah, when I read that verse, that, or verses, because I went beyond that you know, to read, and um, that twelfth chapter of Isaiah speaks clearly to where we are at this moment in regards to um, where uh, the um, the world is headed if if um, Hagee and the uh, Evangelical Church get what they are desiring. Uh, and so far, they have got everything that they went after. And the the objective, according to them, is actually to um, 
control every facet of life in this country, as well as uh, the the uh, military to defend their beliefs. So uh, I I think that that we um, would do well to um, to look at that, and it would give us a clearer picture not only of what has been, but also a clearer picture picture of um, what is being uh, thought by way of uh, controlling the lives of everyone in this country. So, uh, uh, is that, um, the may I, maybe I should ask this, what did you, um, the facilitator who received that article, what did you get from it? Um, Pastor, before we go there, I, if, if someone would kind of uh, give a synopsis or a, a, a brief uh, history of the article, I guess, to tell, tell for those who didn't receive it, if someone can kind of uh, pull it together so everybody can see it. Uh, that, that verse was, was uh, it, it, it wasn't chapter 12 of Isaiah, it was chapter 6, verse 12. And, and maybe we, we, we'll have time to look at that briefly uh, when we finish. But can someone kind of sum up the article uh, for those who did not receive it, please? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so the article basically talks about the uh, ways in which the evangelical, um, sort of certain evangelical Christian groups in the United States are actively seeking political power and influence to, as Pastor Richard said, control the most important facets of uh, American society. Um, those being, I think they listed seven in the article, but you can probably think of uh, all the ones that are important, things like education, uh, the media, arts and entertainment, just everything that affects the way we uh, sort of think and live and relate to each other. Uh, education, of course, being a big one, another one. Uh, and there are religion, religion of course. Um, and there are uh, lobbying groups and sort of active political uh, attempts to influence uh, Congress, presidents, etc. cetera. Um, one of the ones, uh, the particular uh, sort of figures of this move, part of this movement was, uh, as it mentions in the art article, Pastor John Hagee, who was uh, like a friend of Donald Trump and did things like advocate for uh, the moving the uh, U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem um, and doing things like that. But it's all part of the uh, evangelical Christian desire to create the conditions that they think will bring about Armageddon, that they think will bring about the second coming uh, of Jesus. And it is an active, sort of real political force in the United States. Um, and uh, the article talks about this, just the, the degree to which that forms the base of the Republican Party. And it is a majority degree, at least at the national political level. Um, anyway, thank you. No, thank you. And, and, and what also captured my attention was that um, they're advocating the destruction of um, Palestinians um, in order for... Um, for the quote-unquote Jews uh, to return to to um, Israel and to advocate for uh, the destruction uh, of, or the displacement of Palestinians is advocated genocide. And I, I want to, and Nick mentioned uh, those things that they're uh, attempting to control. Now keep in mind, they wanted the embassy moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and they got it. Uh, they meaning um, 
John Hagee. And also keep in mind that Hagee is the one who introduced Nikki Haley when she was uh, a major announcement for the presidency. Uh, she's no, she'd never be president, but it's my contention that she's probably running for vice president. Regardless of who wins that race, if uh, if it's the Republicans winning it, Hagee will control them um, because their their efforts have already been successful in several different areas, and and you can see every day they say they want to control education, religion, family, business. Uh, government slash military, arts, entertainment, as Nick mentioned in the media. Now, they're already controlling education, especially in the southern states and trying to make it national. Um, this is an effort uh, to indoctrinate a nation and eradicate a people, not just in Israel, but in this country as well. They find nothing wrong with what's happening with the police department, and and they are they talk about controlling religion, which means that you're controlling a, a major aspect of people's lives, especially people of African descent. Matter of fact, especially people of color. Period. And when you look at that from this perspective, what does it show us? It, it shows us um, that. The call was made some time ago, who who will I send? And to say that I'll go and and to understand the the background behind that, uh, that particular scripture to me is saying to us, uh, there's more going on than you realize. And you, I need to send someone or have have a God someone uh, to um, mitigate the damage or to change it altogether. So we are at a place now where we cannot say that um, that uh, I don't know. I don't have the words to say. I don't. I don't know how I can affect all these people and change hearts. Uh, you have been, quote unquote, purified in that you have been given a purification, not meaning pure as in how we use that word, but pure as in um, your de- your desired um, speech, your desired thought, your desired actions are all geared toward of uh, bringing a balance to this earth and and um, eradicating anything that separates mankind. And w- with that in Isaiah, what do we find? Uh, we find that that we are in a position, in the position that the Creator intended for us to be in at this point. And everything that Isaiah says or writes in that passage, in that fourth chapter, especially from the eighth verse down uh, to that twelfth, everything that's advocated in those verses are the things that shows us where we are. Bottom line, we're in this space for a reason. And it, and and um, um, when it talks about, I think that twelfth chapter uh, speaks to the idea of, um, of it says, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there will be great forsaken in the midst of the land. Um, this is exactly uh, what the um, pagans of the world are trying to do, and that is. Uh, to create an environment where where everyone is moved to them and not to God, even though it's under the guise of being moved to God. If you are waiting for Armageddon and your preparation for it is taking control of the as- every aspect of people's lives, are you truly waiting for Armageddon? Or are you using that as a cover? for Christianity to be in this nation as it is in Hungary and other, and other countries. The, the, the um, purpose of Christianity is being shown every single day. The whole purpose of Christianity, as we have been taught, is to perpetuate and maintain uh, 
and perpetuate and maintain racism and to rape the world of all of its um, minerals, everything that's of value, to take it un- and put it under the control of Christianity. The bottom line is that Hagee is speaking about establishing something that is no different than what the Vatican is. Establish a, 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 a foundation for total control. The, the richest nation on this earth is the, the Vatican. And there are those who say it's a church, it's not a nation. That's because you don't know the nuts and bolts that surround the Vatican. If you have a seat at the table of ambassadors, then you have you are representing a nation. And when Reagan sent an ambassador or changed the ambassadors with the Vatican, that was recognizing that the Vatican as being a nation state within the confines of Italy. So Hagen is doing, is headed in the same direction with the evangelical religion or evangelical Christianity, or, or, or Christian nationalism. That's where he's headed. And if if we think for a moment that this is far-fetched, then I want you to think of how people prior to being stolen from their land thought it was far-fetched that anyone could be as brutal and barbaric as those who are enslaved people. This is not far-fetched. This is real. This is ongoing. This is the desire of um, of, of, not, of the um, evangelical church. And you say, well, the government will stop them. The evangelical church, for, for all intents and purposes, have become an intricate part of the government and one of the most influential groups uh, in government. They get more done for them. For white people, they get more done than anyone in this country, and it do, and is not just restricted to um, to the Republican Party, because if you look at the silence that that's coming from Biden when it comes to the uh, the way education is being dismantled on the backs of African people you will see that none of them really cares about what happens to us, our ancestry, our history. And we are at a crossroads, and, and we have a choice. We can, we, we can recognize where our energy should be directed, or we can sit back and allow it to happen. There is no power in the government if there is no power in the evangelical church. This article that Nick described actually shifted my belief that we were directing our energy to the wrong sources in terms of our energy being directed to the hearts and minds of the Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump of this world. That is not where the danger lies. That is not where the racism is. That is not the womb of hatred. Evangelical Christianity is. And I would like to know if any of you guys, um, inclusive of those who were listening to uh, the explanation or that the overview that Nick gave us, it, uh, any of you see what I'm mentioning or do you see it differently? Thank you. Well, the, um, I just wanted to add one thing to the article also talked about um, how um, lots of Christian nationalist chaplains are being placed in at posts around in the military, and they are kind of radicalizing some of those rural, rural um, 18 year olds who who are, um, are in a particularly vulnerable place in their lives. So they're, they're sort of 
um, a captured audience for those um, Christian na nationalist chaplains who've been placed there to help them become more, um, help them but also become Christian nationalists. So it's almost like they're, yeah, they're taking over the military and, and the military itself are becoming concerned about those, those individuals who are becoming so Christian nationalists radicalized in the military. It's like they're establishing their own army or something. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, uh, oh, go ahead. Just that part and, and, and go ahead, Nick. Uh, in, in that article in the same vein, uh, uh, Audrey, it, 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 it is, does not escape me that it particularly mentioned Columbia, South Carolina. So uh, I, I mm. thought that was that was a, yeah, a very Fort important Jackson. part. Yeah, Fort Jackson. So okay, all right, thanks, Nick. Yeah, no problem. I just wanted to say that um, this whole uh, movement that they're trying to uh, push and uh, accomplish is their version of. Um, a new <laughs> civil war, quote unquote, which is Christian uh, Taliban. <laughs> Y'all, Qaeda. <laughs> uh, this is their version of a new uh, civil war and the only means by which they will be able to accomplish in any real sense the national divorce uh, that we hear people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and other evangelical Christians in Congress talking about. Um, and it's still uh, not determined whether or not they will be successful to some extent, um, even if they are uh, to some degree successful and they already have been. Um, it's It just changes the, I think, I believe the uh, length of time that we as a collective people, as a human, as humanity, have to deal with the influence of this spiritual insanity. The outcome, I believe, is already set. This uh, mentality, this confusion dissolves. Uh, obviously, it is doing it while kicking and screaming. Um, but we can prevent that <laughs> kicking and screaming, I believe, as we've said through uh, sort of directing our intent, our energy, and uh, just being uh, resonators of that intent and energy as we live our lives. Um, every, every single, I think I've read some things about Gen Z, basically that uh, the religiousness or desire to engage with religion drops off a cliff uh, post-millennial generation. Uh, but that does not mean that there are new forms that that sort of religiousness can take. And if you peel back the layers of Christianity, of course, as we've been speaking about, you eventually get to uh, white supremacy. And that is the direction we're heading in because the religious part of it is not fulfilling. The, Jesus is not appearing in the sky, or at least the, they haven't lost hope for that yet. Um, but every year that goes by that that still has not happened they will get more uh desirous of creating a self-fulfilling prophecy and that's part of what they are doing um anyway yeah thank you so they're waiting for the jesus energy to appear in the sky rather than the jesus energy to appear in the hearts and minds of, of themselves Oh, absolutely. And they will wait forever. Um, because, of course, in order to recognize that it is a spiritual thing, you must let go of your religion. And you must let go of what you actually want out of that religion, which is uh, essentially power and control for various reasons. And that is what you really want. So if if Jesus appeared in a church and said, you need to get rid of this church, they would kill him. 
they would immediately yeah. immediately brand that some form of witchcraft, some form of I don't know something about Harry Potter, and then re-crucify him in the church. But anyway, I agree with that. If um, if if Jesus showed up and told them anything they were doing wrong, they they would they would um crucify him all over again and call him up and say that it's of the devil. However, when I listen at uh, what you say in regards to what's going on uh, um, around the nation and the world, what I what I see is that if Jesus doesn't hurry up and come, which is not in the air, um, they are going to make it happen. They are determined to, to make it happen. And um, uh, if you think or think this is a, a political move, or this is in the realm of politics, uh, when you hear them talk about the Armenian um, white evangelical Christians, when you hear them talking about um, meeting with people like Orderon and Hungary, I guess I pronounced his name right, and um, and um, Netanyahu, when you look at the, the the affection they have for them. You say, well, that's politics. It has nothing to do with Jesus. It has nothing to do with God or spirituality. That's exactly what you are have been trained to think. It's not politics. It's Christianity that's been controlling politics. That's what it is. You can no longer look at anything as simply being political because it is not. Everything that happens within, within the the um, uh, arena of politics, 99 and 9 10% of it has been pushed there by um, evangelical uh, Christian nationalists. Look at the Supreme Court. They did that. Um, look at the number of military people who were involved in, um, in, in January 6th, uh, the, the uh, insurrection. Look at the amount of money uh, that evangelical churches pumped into uh, the campaign for Trump, and and the uh, look at how the evangelicals are embracing uh, the and and everything that he's putting out there. This politics is is the the dress that he puts on, or it's the pantsuit, or it is the the um, Brooks brother suit that it puts on, but beneath that Brooks brother suit is the pure nakedness of racism, and they wrap themselves in the flag and allow a few who look like us to enter uh, into um, enter into their quarters and tell us that. Church and politics, or church and government, should never be mixed. While at the same time, they are the ones who's controlling it all. So don't be don't be uh, blinded by that. And please, please remember who you are. Don't be so caught up in what you've been told about what the scripture says in regards to Jesus uh, and God. Don't be caught up in that because. It's designed uh, to keep us where we are. And I say all of that to say this. We have a responsibility. We have an obligation. And that is to maintain the journey that we're on for the purpose of bringing humanity uh, to a place of unicity and ending all this, uh, everything that's been done to separate inclusive of the thievery of people and things. Um, one of the reasons I, I, I believe that, that all of this is coming to a head uh, is because, it is because um, there, at some point their hand has to be shown. And right now there are those of us who are on, who's on this phone and we 
we know that the people who stand in, in the pulpit are, are, are being supported by um, evangelical churches. And, and that is simply to manipulate and control. Look at this Easter. Easter's coming up sometime, I think is next month. But anyway, whenever Easter comes into play, well, it got to be next month. Uh, Easter comes into play, then what happens? Uh, they began to exchange pulpit, and that in itself is keeping an eye on what's happening in the African church to make sure that it's still following the script of evangelical nationalist Christianity. Thank you. Questions or comments? Um, I don't have a question. I'm going to hear it. Yeah, I wanted to Go add. Ahead. And within all of there, speaking about how Jerusalem needs to be uh, essentially made the center of white European uh, religious power, um, and all they're talking about the importance that Jewish people play in the sort of end times that they envision. Uh, please understand, they do not like Jewish people. <laughs> As I said, they peel back enough of the layers and you get to white supremacy. They don't like Jewish people. They need Jewish people because of their part to play in the uh, sort of end times drama that they believe they are in control of and ultimately benefits them. Um, and I just wanted to make that clear. Wherever you see all these uh, sort of evangelical or conservative uh, politicians courting the favor of Jewish people. It doesn't have any, they, they don't like Jewish people. Trump does not like Jewish people. <laughs> Just, he can get, he literally has gotten in front of groups of Jewish people and called them and used anti Semitic like stereotypes about them to their face. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I only want Jews touching my money. Just all kind of stuff. I, you guys are very good with money, I hear. <laughs> Just all of that kind of stuff, literally. Um, which is why, again, it's amazing that it is Donald Trump and not somebody else who knows what they're doing. Which is kind of why I sort of want him to win in 2024, but you did not hear that from me. We'll see what happens. Good morning. This is Mayor. I, I have a question, uh, and I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I'm thinking, but I don't know. Do you think the Vatican is going to sit back and let the evangelicals take over the world? I know they have, they can't do too much about the United States, but I'm thinking about all the Roman Catholics that we have in the whole world. The Vatican just going to let this happen. Any thoughts about that? Uh, the Vatican helped Hitler. Why wouldn't they? Um, the Vatican does not care about anybody of color either. If you if you peel the layers back on slavery, what you will find out is that the bulk of the Vatican's income came from slavery. Their riches, their their wealth was built on slavery, and there was an ecumenical meeting. Uh, in the year 2000, where the evangelicals, where well, all Christian denominations uh, came together with the Catholic Church and made a vow that even though they were a different sect of Christianity, all of them were Christians, and the ones who called that meeting was the Vatican, and all of them fell in line with the Vatican. So it, there is no difference between the Vatican and what they are doing. The only difference, I guess, is the Vatican already has his own army. That's right. It. That's it. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking. They have their army, uh, and they, and I don't know. I don't know. That just came to mind about them. Eventually, there be there will be fighting for for control because the evan evangelicals are not going to bow down to the Roman Catholics. I don't think to the Pope. So I just see a whole lot happening. In the, in the future, so 
know where to concentrate the energy. So thank I, that's just a thought. Thank you. Mary, they won't fight each other. The Vatican does not care what you believe. As long as you believe what they have told you to believe, they don't care whether you bow to them or not. It doesn't matter. Everything that's preached from the pulpit originated in the Vatican. All the uh, white Christian nationalism originated in the Vatican, every bit of it. So it doesn't matter. Um, there are things out there that that is hard to find, and the books that they are in, the history of it, are so expensive, people don't buy them. But I was crazy enough to buy uh, one that deals with that. They don't care. They do not care. Look at what happened. Who told you that Easter is supposed to be a period to worship Jesus? The Vatican. Who told you that Christmas is December 25th? The Vatican. Who told you that you are supposed to have communion at least once a month? The Vatican. Who told you that baptism was a water baptism? The Vatican. You may do it differently, but they don't care. It's still the same concept. So all of the rituals and principles that are already in the Christian Nationalist Church are the same rituals that came from the Vatican. Who told you that women cannot preach, that women cannot um, serve communion? The Vatican. So everything that, that all the prince, the foundation of all Christianity is the Vatican and the rituals are exactly the same, and it doesn't matter whether you are in the charismatic setting or the evangelical setting or the black Baptist setting. All are the same. And keep in mind, for those of you who think that evangelicals are different, they are not. I'm sorry, the uh, charismatic church is different. No, they are. charismatic church is a part of the evangelical movement. I'm not telling you something that I heard. I'm telling you something that I experienced when I was connected at the high echelon of the charismatic church. So I, I hope that helps. So Mary, don't don't think they are not going to fight each other until they can't fight us anymore, and they always fight each other then. I know. Um, thanks for sharing that. That is that that cuts deep. So it's and it it, it just breaks my heart that. But but there is hope, and I am thankful that I'm connected to the Creator, and I I know that the, it's just it's just troubling to me, and it's just it hurts, and I I I have no words. It almost makes you want to cry to see how ah uh, I don't know, but but thanks, thank you. No, thank you for bringing it up. Um, Reverend Richard, or, or anyone who can answer the question, um, Hannibal's daddy, and Hannibal, for those that know, uh, good for those that don't know, Hannibal um, was a great emperor, and he was able to take elephants over mountains, and he went to war with Rome or the Catholic Church. Uh, yet Hannibal's daddy instilled in him at a young age, never see Rome and or the Catholic Church as an ally or a friend. And it, I've never been able to find out why Hannibal's daddy told him that, but does anyone know why um, Hannibal's daddy told Hannibal not to ever see Rome as an ally or a friend? Yes, sir. Anyone want to want to approach or want to address that? The Roman Church was uh, taking tribute from all nations that it had taken control of, and if you didn't pay tribute, you were arrested, or your property was taken, and that continued. Uh, until the um, until England 
got tired of it. And the king uh, ran the Catholics out of England and established the, uh, and the Angelical Church in place of it because it was um, the nation had to pay tribute, and they were actually going broke, uh, fooling with um, the Pope in Rome. And the control that they had did not completely slip away in terms of being the, the uh, primary uh, emperor, for lack of a better word, for different countries uh, in Eastern Europe. They controlled Eastern Europe. That was their last bastion of total control in, in Europe, was Eastern Europe. And, and again, that really weak, was weakened during World War uh, II. And if you look at the people of color who are in Catholic, Catholic nations, that are people of color, all of them are poor. If you look at the Catholic nations um, that are Caucasian, they are wealthy. And, uh, and they milk all of the, the um, countries of people of color for everything that they have. And they also own a uh, large bulk of the property. So this thing did not end with Hannibal's daddy telling him. Hannibal's daddy saw what they were doing, and we need to see now that they're still doing the same thing. It is, it is more shrouded now than it was then. But that it was all based on tribute. I hope that helped. I'm sure there's more to it than that. I know it is because I read it. I just can't remember it. That's all. And and for confirmation, Reverend Richard, Hannibal was a person of color, correct? He was true African, yes. Thank you, George. Was there someone else, Nick, where you were about to say something? Uh, Earlier? No. Um, no, I'm good. Okay. Was there someone else? It is, uh, it is my desire that when we get off this phone today, that we get off of this phone on a high, on, on just, just feeling good about who we are and where we are with this thing, uh, with, with the, 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 the world right now. A uh, couple things. Several weeks ago, I don't know if you, if you remember, if you know, it, in the morning, some of my most vivid dreams happen right before you wake up when you're in that state of sleep and not being asleep and i had this this dream or, or if you will a vision or whatever about uh an event that happened in my life that w was kind of traumatized me and, and it was a real event and i remember laying there thinking why are you reliving this and i remember uh going through some of the steps i took to try to make this keep this from happening and 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 it happened to me anyway and i woke up and i thought uh i remember feeling the same way i felt when i was going through this thing and i analyzed it to death and 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 uh i i remember thinking lord i feel you here but what is this what what is going on and i went on throughout my day with it in my mind and 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 that's when it hit me it hit me by mid morning that morning that you know things happen to us and we pray about them and when we pray our humanness sees an outcome an expected outcome but in my 64 years what i pray for never happens the way i see it and and sometimes what this was showing me was you ask for something and then you what you envision is not 
the reality of what's supposed to happen to, to bring about the enlightenment that you need. This happened to bring you enlightenment or to show you something, but you messed it up because you try to show you, you try to fix it to bring yourself comfort rather than enlightenment. So as I as I thought about that and thought, wow, how many times have I gotten in the way of my prayer and my desire? So what am I saying here? What we ask for affects the whole universe. And this thing is happening. And, and it's happening in a way that none of us envisioned it to happen. And Pastor said something earlier, and actually Nick talked about the energy of it as well. We are on the right track now. We've looked at politics. We've looked at the White House. We've talked about this person and that person. But it's all about religion. It's all about truth versus religion. That's what Jesus dealt with. He dealt with the church. So where we are now is a good place. And as he, Pastor, referenced uh, the, the, the sixth chapter of Isaiah, what I want to ask him to do again is just reiterate, whether you use Isaiah or something else, why are we at the right place? Why are all these things happening? And the energy, the place that we are, we see it. We, we see that we're at the place we're supposed to be, what is taking place, all the chaos, all the, the, the darkness and, and, and the energy that is, that, is, that is just kind of reveling up the storm, uh, it is all happening for a reason. And, 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 and we are right in the midst of that. And this is where they're supposed to be at this time. Can you, can you, can you pass to speak to that one more time and just bring some comfort to, to when we get off this phone that we realize that we know who we are without a doubt. And the things that we meditate on and the, and, 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 and the, the place that we have in the earth this time and, and the relationship with the ancestors and, and seeing that we're Elohim is all taking place. The here and now is greater than the future. It's greater than the past because it ties it all together. Can, can you help me with that, to see that so we all be at the same place when we hang up? Ron, sorry. Can I say something yeah. before the pastor um, comes yes. in? Um, because what you said struck me in terms of um, what you said when we experience trauma and it comes back and back and back. Um, and and why does it do that? Um, and my true belief is that it does that so we can so we can change it. So that we have, we are giving opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to change it within ourselves, um, so that we can move on from it. I mean, I truly believe that that's why it comes back and back and back. Um, sometimes we handle it well, and we change it within ourselves, and sometimes we don't. But we're just given that opportunity. To, to know that we are Elohim and we can affect change in the situation. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. No, thank you. Thank you. That needed to be added. Thank you. And I agree totally with that. Um, when we talk about bringing balance to humanity, we're also talking about repurposing the energy that traumatized people. And when that energy is repurposed, it strengthens us. Um, first of all, let me say, let me preface what I'm going to say by saying this. Some of you at some time are going to be in conversations, and uh, people um, of uh, European origin are going to ask you questions. And when you respond to those questions with the truth, if you, um, sometimes you're going to be called a racist or playing the race card. So how do you respond to that? Um, my response has been the same for years. I cannot be a racist 
but by the definition of racism. I, it's impossible because I've never enslaved anybody. I've never lynched anyone. I've never redlined anyone and told them where they can live and where they can't live. I've never put anyone in a position where they couldn't work and they had to still to live. So I can't be a racist based upon your definition of racist. So keep that in mind because that's often said in order to shut you up or to make you feel uncomfortable. Now, to what Ron um, asked, uh, first of all, when we look at um, this chapter of in Isaiah, this uh, sixth chapter, what do we see? Uh, we, what we see is that we have made the same decision that's written about here. We have made a decision to, to hear the uh, voice of the universe, the voice of Yahweh. What does it say? Who, who can I send? It's simply speaking to where you go. And we have answered that by making a decision that we want to um, bring balance to the earth. When we made that decision, we had no clue of what we were headed into. And the Creator knew what was coming, but the Creator also knew that we have a desire to benefit humanity in everything that we do. And the Creator saw that and sent us forward. Sent us forward where? Forward to questions. Sent us into a room full of questions. And as the questions were raised, they were answered. And because of the, the questions being answered, we saw that we had clearly accepted uh, the uh, charge to move forward on behalf of humanity. In the beginning, we thought that the greatest battle was racism. And then we were shown something. The greatest battle for us is not racism because uh, we cannot stop anyone from being racist. They have to stop themselves. We can't change anyone's racist heart anymore then we can change the way people think unless they choose to change. We saw that. And then we began to look at the depth of the soul of man. And and the way we were looking at that was, in order for us to change, I'm, I'm sorry, in order for us to bring balance to humanity, we must um, understand what's in the book and put it in the macro. And other people's hearts will change by virtue of them searching for something more. Well, the Creator introduced something a, a couple of years ago that brought everything to a standstill, and that's coronavirus. Uh, and um, that standstill gave everybody opportunity to, to not only reflect but to pay attention to what was going on right then and right now. And that reflection um, brought them to a place of, of choosing, making a choice about the direction that they wanted to travel in. And what happened when we, as we traveled the journey, we saw that wealth was increasing for very few people. We saw uh, that um, our eyes were needed to be uh, our eye needed to be open, as opposed to our eyes. We saw that we need to hear with our hearts and not with our ears. And as that happened, um, we began to see that even though things looked like they were great on, on the surface, uh, beneath the surface was rot, and beneath the surface was, um, was, was hunger. Beneath the surface was a, a, a religion that was designed to keep um, people of color in bondage and at the same time to confuse the minds of young uh, Caucasian uh, people, especially Caucasian males, so that they uh, would carry on, carry the banner of Christian nationalism. And, and here we are now, out of, um, out of all of this, that we, we have um, actually been shown uh, what we are seeing now 
is that um, that there is a move uh, from the uh, church that's more powerful move from the government, and that move from the government is a uh, that move from the um, church rather worldwide, and we we see two things here. Number one, um, the worldwide movement of of our Christian nationalism is all about seeing with your eyes. You're seeing the color of somebody's skin with your eyes, seeing the wealth that is underground in, in our nations uh, that people of color dwell in, seeing the, the uh, control that you want to exert so you can satisfy your greed and your racism. That's what we are seeing now. This is where we are now. Yet in the face of that, we are we have been shown how to see with our eye, and seeing with our eye, we see beneath what the eyes are seeing, and we see uh, the efforts that are being taken. I did not stumble on the article that we were talking about earlier; that was given to me. I do believe that it was brought to my attention on purpose because. That article tells us where we are right now, and it also tells us something else. It tells us you are in the place where you are supposed to be at this time. It also uh, tells us uh, to to um, to understand where our energy uh, what needs to be focused. The focal point for the energy is um, religion. Why? Because the government is not spiritual at all. It is religion that pretends to be spiritual while at the same time seeking to control everything in the society. So if, when our energy is directed towards the efforts that are being made to control this country, this, this world, the inhabitants thereof, when our energy is focused on religion and in particular uh, Christianity, we would then begin uh, to see a shift. And the shift that we will see is um, the, the um, removal, or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, pre, re, the repurposing of that energy that has, that has been uh, bringing people to a place of racism. When we repurpose that energy, we began to see a huge um, number of people walking away from Christianity, and the the way that that Christianity uh, continues to exist beneath the surface is being um, weakened. How is that so? The Creator is showing us that when we un when we unfold the truths that are in this in the Scripture, when they are revealed to us and we share them, we explore them. We talk about them. We live them. When that happens, there are, there's a greater falling away from the church than ever before. And when that, that weakens the foundation upon which racism has been built from the beginning, that weakens the foundation of greed, that weakens the foundation uh, of uh, a nation of barbarians and began to bring civility to the hearts and minds of those who have been living as barbarians for hundreds of years, if not thousands. So what, what am I saying to you? I am saying to you, you have no reason to fret, and you have no reason to have hope at all. We are at a place of knowing. Hope is always looking for something to happen. Knowing is, is knowing that it is happening at this very moment. Knowing um, it gives us a stronger sense of not only who we are, but where we are. Because when you know who you are, you know that you can influence everything in the realm of the spirit, thus influencing the earth itself. Even though you may not understand it, it doesn't matter. Your desire, your genuine, pure desire for 
unicity among men, for harmony for mankind. That's what's important. This is not about James and Phoebe. This is not about any individual people. This is this is about humanity, period. And the only reason that we were given names in the scriptures as we use names now is because they send um, um, a message. The message is using earthly examples to give you spiritual truth. And the spiritual truth, where we are at this moment, is that the kingdom of Christianity is crumbling. And our continued efforts in seeking truth will bring it to the place where it exists no more in terms of its power. If there are questions or comments, please raise them or make the comments. Thank you. And I hope, Ron, that I answered, uh, I responded, rather, to what you asked. Yes, sir. Thank you. Questions or comments, anyone? Never feel overwhelmed. No matter what we see on TV or newspaper or online or wherever, we are who we are for a purpose. I, if there are no other questions or comments, I think this is a good place to pause. Uh, and uh, it's been a good session. I hope and trust everyone has a great day and uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Thanks again, Al. Thank you, sir. Yeah, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, everyone. Okay.